Thank you all. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. My name is Maggie McIntyre, and I am the executive director for the Association of Nova Scotia Museums. I am very pleased to be able to have you all join from PEI New Brunswick and Nova Scotia for this really important conversation. Uh, this project was originally or was uh, launched last week at the Canadian Museum Association, and as I was saying to Carolyn, or Caroline, sorry, uh, that. If the presentation she does today is as good as the CMA, I know we're all going to be leaving really inspired. Um, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that the Association of Nova Scotia Museums is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory in mutual respect and gratitude. I'd also like to take a moment today to acknowledge it's International Women's Day and for everyone to take into account what that means in their life, both recognizing the important role that women play today in the museum sector, in our own personal lives, and making sure that the world is a safe and good place going forward for all members of our society and all women um, in the full definition and broad definition of women, including transgender. I would like to um, let everyone know also that for logistics, this session is being, being recorded and will be made available on the Anthem website afterwards. The, because we have so many people in the group today, that sometimes can cause bandwidth issues. So if you want to turn off your camera, you are welcome to do so, and that can improve your bandwidth. We also are going to have some resources put into the group chat, which you can follow along there. We will have time for questions at the end, and I really look forward to hearing what you all think about this project. So on that note, I'm going to take no more of your time, because no one's here to hear from me. And I'm going to turn this over to Caroline Lowen, and from the Alberta Museum Association. And I'm really excited to have, have her join us. Thanks, Maggie. Um, <clears throat> I'm very excited to be here. I'm just on the tail end of a cold. I'll just let everyone know. So if my voice is kind of scratchy, that is why. So I may have to take a few pauses to drink water. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm gonna get going with my presentation right away. But before I do, I'm gonna put a link in the chat which is a link to the French version of my slides. The presentation today, I will be speaking in English. My slides are in French and English, but if you want a solely French version to follow along with, um, go to that link in the chat and um, hopefully it works for everybody. It should take you to a PDF of my slide deck in French. Um, there will also be auto-generated captions in French. They are auto-generated, so there will be errors, um, but those are there. Um, as well to increase accessibility, language accessibility. So I am going to share my screen and get my presentation going. <clears throat> okay, I'm hoping everyone can see that. If I don't hear otherwise, I'll assume all is well. And I'm just going to minimize you folks so that I can see my notes. Great. OK, so the webinar today is Introduction to Reconsidering Museums. Some of you may have heard of this project um, or even seen previous presentations. But we are coming to the end of the project. We're actually launching the website and toolkit next week on Wednesday, so a week from today. So you're getting a bit of a sneak peek um, into what is included in the toolkit and on the website. So I'm going to jump right in. Like Maggie said, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. So um, if you can hold your questions, we'll have, the presentation is about probably 35 minutes. So at the end, we'll have um, 15 to 20 minutes to have a conversation. We can go through the website at that time as well if there's no question. So I am going to jump right in. So We Considering Museums is a national project that takes place on the territories of many Indigenous peoples. So we wanted to acknowledge that our work takes place across the land that is now known as Canada. 
We acknowledge the colonial legacy of museums and the harm caused by our sector, and we commit to respect and promote Indigenous people's right to self-determination. We're seeking to collect the many perspectives that contribute to our shared history, present and future as we work towards reconciliation. So Reconsidering Museums is a research and advocacy project that provides relevant contemporary data on the social value of museums, messaging to communicate and affirm that value and resources to support museums in responding to changing public perceptions and expectations of museums. It was launched in 2020, Reconsidering Museums was undertaken in partnership with a consortium of provincial and territorial museums associations and the Canadian Museums Association led by the Alberta Museums Association. The first phase of the project and one you've probably heard about before um, was to listen to Canadians and to collect data on their views on the role, value and future of museums. Museums for Me was an online engagement campaign that included a series of consultations undertaken by Hill and Knowlton Strategies Canada on behalf of the consortium. From October 2020 to March 2021, an online survey was fielded in both French and English. The survey collected 1,759 responses. Due to the nature of distribution and promotion through the provincial and territorial museums associations, respondents were more likely to be avid museum goers than the general public. To counter this bias, the consortium also conducted public opinion research through Leger Opinion's online panel, collecting 1,400 additional responses over the period March 12th to 17th, 2021. The sample was randomly selected based on quotas to reflect census data for age, gender, and regions in Canada. Respondents who identified as Indigenous and those with a household income below 40,000 a year were oversampled by an extra 200 cases to ensure representation from those groups. The data was weighted to ensure representativeness by age, gender, and region. We also hosted dialogue sessions in November, December 2020, three in English and one in French. Participants had to register to take part and there were 87 participants. An additional online meeting was hosted with the fellows of the Canadian Museums Association with seven fellows participating. The engagement campaign was central to reconsidering museums and the data collected informed the creation of the subsequent messaging and toolkit that you'll hear more about today. To learn more about the research and the findings, you can read the What We Heard report, which is available as part of the toolkit. <clears throat> so Reconsidering Museums is the first time since 1973 that a national study gathered data on the Canadian public's perceptions and attitudes towards museums. So that's about 50 years ago. The 1973 study was titled The Museum and the Canadian Public. It was written by Brian Dixon, Alice Courtney and Robert Bailey, and it was conducted in conjunction with Canada's first national museum policy, which was released the previous year. So our research is timely, as everybody knows, there's a new national museum policy in the works um, for 2023. So to understand changes in public perception between Museums for Me in 2021 and the 1973 study, we considered three questions. What has stayed the same? What has changed? And what will change? So as a little snapshot, in 1972, there were 838 museums in Canada. As of 2016, which is the last time this data was collected, the number has more than tripled to over 2,600 museums in Canada. So there has been a change in public perception and attitudes towards museums since 1973 that reflects not only the increasing number of museums for Canadians to visit, but an increase in museums public programming as well as societal changes. We'll go through some of the data here. The following tables illustrate some of the key changes. So the data sources for the following tables are the 1973 data is from Museum and the Canadian Public. The 2012 to 2016 data is from Statistics Canada and that's from their general surveys that they do. And the 2021 data is from Museums for Me, specifically the Leger Opinion online panel. So if you wanna learn more and get into a bit of the detail about Canadians changing perceptions, you can read the report that's part of the toolkit called Trust and Value. You'll see a the cover of it there on the screen. So here's a little bit of how things have changed or not changed. 
The percentage of Canadians visiting museums has not changed significantly between the two studies, but there is an increase in the perception that museums are expensive as of 2021. However, the percentage of Canadians who see museums as elitist has decreased significantly since 1973. Today, the vast majority of Canadians do not consider museums to be elitist. Today, museums are not just places for tourists. Education, but not necessarily learning as a primary role is declining slightly in importance since 1973. Well, the preservation of Indigenous knowledge and collections is increasingly a more important role for the museum. Canadians still consider museums to be trusted sources and good places for children. However, there was a decrease in the percentage of Canadians who found museums to reflect their culture and heritage today, likely due to Canada's increasingly growing and diverse population. So with that in mind, let's look at where museums are going. Canada is becoming more diverse. How Canadians think about the past and understand heritage is changing, particularly regarding Indigenous histories and cultures. How will museums reflect the heritage of Canada's increasingly diverse population? How will museums embody reconciliation with Indigenous peoples? In response to Call to Action 67, you may have seen that our partners at the Canadian Museums Association have just released Move to Action, a report to support museums in acting on truth and reconciliation. A few more um, data points that we found quite interesting. By 2050, roughly 25% of the population will be over the age of 65. Maybe counterintuitively, museum attendance actually tends to decrease with age, often due to disability issues. How will museums ensure improved accessibility for the growing number of Canadians over 65? The frequency of museum visitation increases with level of education and the majority of younger Canadians have post-secondary education and this number is increasing. How will museums ensure that content is credible and appealing to this well-educated audience? Canadians are also confronting significant global changes in climate and the environment, and they want museums to provide unbiased and credible content and context around these issues. How do museums plan to address the climate crisis both through education and their own climate actions? Although Canadians continue to trust and value museums and see them as community institutions, there is an uncertainty that museums can continue to sustain this trust and value in the face of these future challenges. We hope that the data and resources created by Reconsidering Museums can help museums respond to our changing world and support museums to take action towards making the necessary changes Canadians want to see in their museums. So let's have a look at the Museums for Me data in a bit more depth. The research through Museums for Me revealed three main themes, access, authority, and activism. Access is about removing barriers and can refer to different types of accessibility, including physical, financial, cultural, and intellectual accessibility. Accessibility in museums means that source communities have access to collections and that information and knowledge is shared in a way that is understandable, relevant, and engaging. It means that the museum is inclusive and a place where people see themselves reflected in, in exhibits, collections, and programs. So Canadian museums are doing this well, but have room to grow. Canadians know about and visit museums, feel welcome in them, recognize them as safe spaces, but nearly all want museums to be more inclusive and representative of their communities. So some additional highlights from the data here. 94% of respondents agreed that museums make them feel welcome and provide what they need for their visits. 88% of respondents agree that the museum is a safe space. 76% of respondents agree that museums give people a sense of belonging and membership in a community. While 52% of respondents agree that museums need to better represent all Canadians. Authority is about the perception that museums are trusted to provide accurate and credible information. Canadians continue to trust museums and to consider them a credible source of information. They value museums for their role in preservation and learning. But to maintain this role, respondents indicated that the museum must imagine its reimagine its relationship to the truth and as a trusted advisor to the publics it serves. Canadians want museums to continue to tell the truth, but to also embrace more diverse types of expertise including community knowledge and lived experience. 
some highlights for the data. 95% of respondents agree that the museum is a place to preserve and care for art and objects and to tell their stories. 95% of respondents agree that the museum is a place to learn and be inspired. 80% of respondents agree that the museum is a, that museums are a highly credible source of information above daily newspapers and television. 58% of respondents agree that museums should have dialogue with local communities to develop programs that resonate with community interests. Our final theme is activism. Activism is about the role of museums as change makers, allies, and leaders in a changing society. Canadians are divided on the question of neutrality, but not on the need for museums to take a leading role on important issues. They see that the museum has value as a teacher, ally, and an agent of change. Canadians see the potential of the museum as a possible leader and a model, poised to act, but doubt that the sector will rise to the challenge. Some highlights from the data. 94% of respondents think that the museum can address societal issues. 65% agree that museums should play a prominent role in education when it comes to addressing societal issues. 44% of respondents agree that museums should play a more active role in advocating for social change. Now this number goes up to 62% for ages 18 to 34. So it's really important when we think about the future of museums. So based on the research findings and with the future of museums in mind, the consortium developed a new value proposition, collecting perspectives for museums to help reframe their role and value in contemporary Canada. I'll read it out. We value museums because they make sense of the world around us. They collect our tangible and intangible heritage and invite us to share in the many stories they help tell. Their collections broaden, inspire, and facilitate a shift in our thinking. But the most important work of museums is in collecting perspectives, in showing us how our stories are told. And on the screen, that's just the, the what I've just read out in French. The development of this new value proposition was driven by data collected during museums for me. So some highlights from the data to support collecting perspectives. 95% of respondents agree that the museum is a place to preserve and care for art and objects and to tell their stories. 93% of respondents agree that museums spark curiosity, provoke wonder and promote creativity and a love of learning. 93% of respondents agree that museums help them understand other cultures and communities. 88% of respondents agree that museums give us information and perspective on important cultural and social issues. So museums are more than collectors of art and objects. They collect perspectives in order to collaborate with their communities, learn from each other, amplify diverse voices, communicate a message, advocate towards justice in their communities, activate their visitors to take action and ultimately inspire change. So to expand on the Collecting Perspectives platform, um, I'll jump into some of those verbs. Museums collect perspectives to collaborate. Museums need their community. Community access, engagement and collaboration are foundational for responsible museum work. As the production, distribution, and control of information continues to shift, museums are no longer the sole holder of knowledge. By collaborating with and empowering communities, museums show that they value collective expertise rather than attempting to maintain ownership of our shared cultural narratives. 76% agree that museums give people a sense of belonging and membership in a community. Learn. Museums are learners too. Museums encourage lifelong learning for their visitors and themselves. Through an openness to growing, adapting and revising, museums acknowledge multiple ways of knowing and build a reciprocal relationship with their community. Our stories are always evolving and our understanding and interpretation of those stories must evolve as well. 87% of respondents agreed that museums advance knowledge as research institutions. 
amplify, museums provide a platform. As trusted public institutions, museums are in a position to amplify the voices of their community. By giving voice to and centering diverse community perspectives, museums can see themselves as conduits of ideas rather than the source. Representation of the community leads to increased community relevance. Remember 93% agree that museums help them understand other cultures and communities. Communicate, museums have something to say. Canadians trust museums to tell the truth about our shared history. Museums are a place for dialogic learning where ideas are communicated openly with the goal of creating dialogue that leads to empathy and mutual understanding. Museums can be civic spaces for productive and respectful discourse at a time when seemingly irreconcilable points of view dominate our daily lives. Museums take a stand. Museums can be credible advocates for causes that are aligned with their values. By supporting mission-centric causes, museums can live out their values and affect meaningful social change in their communities remembering that 94% think that museums can address societal issues. The museums encourage participation. Museums are active and playful spaces where visitor inter interaction and creativity are encouraged. Visitors should be encouraged to engage with perspectives at the museum and be inspired to contribute their own. A museum is also a school for the senses where visitors can connect with their tactile, sensory and emotional sides. Museums can surprise, delight, and astonish visitors by the many meanings, connections, and sensations they provoke. And finally, inspire. Museums inspire change. A visit to the museum should change the way you see the world around you. 95% of respondents agree that the museum is a place to learn and be inspired. So these actions are interconnected with the themes of access, authority, and activism. <clears throat> to build on the imperative for museums to rethink access, authority, and activism, the Truth Be Bold campaign was also developed. So I'll read it out. Truth be bold. Whose truth? Museums have long asserted themselves as the authority, the experts, the holders of truth. But historically, they have often told half-truths, singular narratives, or misinterpretations entirely. Museums can do better. The truth is that there is more than one truth. By collecting and sharing multiple, parallel, and divergent perspectives, museums have an opportunity to tell a fuller truth about our shared history, a truth that is not singular, but contains multitudes. And here it is on the screen. So Truth Be Bold is a public campaign to highlight the important work of museums as both authority and advocate. The development of this came was, campaign was driven by data collected during Museums for Me few highlights from the data to support Truth Be Bold. As you've heard, 80% of respondents agree that museums are a credible source of information. And 94% of respondents think that museums can address societal issues like climate change, reconciliation, technological innovation, and increasing inequalities. While 52% of respondents agree that the museum needs to better represent all Canadians. So this campaign serves as a call to action for museums, as well as a marketing campaign to encourage the public to think differently about the role of museums, particularly in an age of mistrust and disinformation. These two public campaigns, Collecting Perspectives and Truth Be Bold, are just two of the many resources available in the Reconsidering Museums Toolkit. The toolkit is designed to make it easy for you to incorporate the data collected and the messaging developed by reconsidering museums into your work. All types of museum workers, volunteers and supporters will find this toolkit useful. The intention is for you to use the resources to articulate the value of museums more effectively and to respond to changing public expectations around the role of museums. 
Consistency is key, and that comes when like-minded people start to speak the same language about the importance of museum work. The resources in this toolkit were piloted by six museums in Alberta with diverse mandates, budgets, audiences, and governance structures to ensure that the toolkit is adaptable and useful for a variety of sites. The pilot sites were Atlas Coal Mine National Historic Site, Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park, Fort McMurray Heritage Village and Shipyard, Galt Museum and Archives, the Millet and District Museum, and the Royal Alberta Museum. There are three types of resources in the toolkit, informational, communications, and advocacy tools. Informational tools will provide you with an overview of the data that was collected through the engagement campaign, Museums for Me. So you've heard a little bit about this already, but I'll go through the tool, the individual tools. There's the What We Heard report that provides an in-depth analysis of what was heard through the Museums for Me engagement campaign, campaign, including methodology, themes, and two appendices with the survey and public opinion polling data. Read this one if you wanna get more in-depth on the raw data. The Trust and Value Report, which provides a comparative analysis of the 1973 study um, with the data collected in 2021 as part of Museums for Me. You can read this if you wanna learn how Canadians' perceptions of museums have changed or stayed the same. And then there's fact sheets. These fact sheets provide specific data points and quotes from survey respondents in relation to the changing functions of museums. So there's nine different pages. You can use these data points to strengthen how you speak about the role and value of museums. So like I said, you've already had a brief overview of some of the data available in informational tools in this presentation. So we'll move on to communications tools. The communications tools will help you adopt and share the evidence-backed language recommendations and messaging developed in response to the research. So there's the Collecting Perspectives Communications Package. This package includes the Collecting Perspectives graphics and messaging, as well as a how-to guide for creating a social media post using the free to use online graphic design tool Canva. You can use this package to create your own Collecting Perspectives social media campaign. So you can insert your own images, um, you can adapt the text. There's a Truth Be Bold Communications Package this package includes the Truth Be Bold graphics, which you'll see on the screen, and messaging, as well as a how-to guide for posting on social media. So you can use this package to create your own Truth, Truth Be Bold social media campaign for your own museum. Then we've created language recommendations. This resource includes evidence-backed recommendations for how to speak about the changing role and value of museums, while avoiding some of the outdated language around museums. So read these, to learn how to reframe the conversation around museums. And finally, data stories. So the data stories differ from the fact sheets in that the data stories transform the data from Museums for Me into specific, usable, and focused data insights on the work and value of museums. So they create a narrative around the data. So you can read these data stories to understand how Canadians' perceptions of museums are shifting and to gain insight on visitation. Now you've already seen collecting perspectives and truth be bold. So let's briefly explore the language recommendations and data stories in a bit more detail. Here's the language recommendations. There are three language recommendations that are designed to facilitate a more productive conversation around the role and value of museums. There's one recommendation for each of the themes of access, authority, and activism. The recommendations came out of a desire to create a shared language around the value of museums, while acknowledging that certain words like neutral and elitist that have been associated with museums in the past do not always have a shared meaning. Neutrality means something different to museum workers than it does to the public. And this creates confusion around the role of the museum. So the three recommendations are from elitist to relevant, from authority to collaboration, and from neutrality to credible advocacy. 
So the document goes into a bit more depth around the data to support this and some suggested reframes, but I'm gonna read out to you the sort of paragraph that we're suggesting around reframing the conversation. From elitist to relevant. The majority of Canadians report feeling welcome and safe in museums. However, many do not feel as though the museum represents them. The idea that museums are not for them persists as many people do not see themselves and their interests, communities and histories represented in the museum's collections, exhibits and programming. The disconnect is because the museums are not presenting stories that are relevant to their lived experience, not because people find museums elitist. People would visit museums more if museums told stories that are relevant to them and their communities. The second reframe, from authority to collaboration. Authority is held by everyone. Museums share authority with communities by collaborating pro to produce and disseminate knowledge, multiple types of knowledge, including oral histories and experiential knowledge are valued and included. The relationship between museums and their communities is relational, not transactional. Through those relationships, the museum can move from seeing themselves as the expert to embracing the role of learner. By doing this, museums earn the trust of their communities through reciprocity and knowledge sharing, not solely expertise. Visitors are seen as community members that actively participate with the museum to co-create their own learning experience. From neutrality to credible advocacy, museums are trusted institutions that can combat disinformation and encourage critical thinking by presenting the facts, sharing multiple perspectives and creating space for dialogue. Museums should acknowledge their biases and encourage visitors to reflect on their own. Museums have a role to play in addressing societal issues like reconciliation, the climate crisis and inequity. Younger Canadians in particular want museums to take a more active role in advocating for social issues because they are accountable to their communities. So if you wanna learn more about the language recommendations, you can find that resource in the toolkit. The next communications tool that we'll talk about in a bit more depth is the data stories. There are five data stories that can help you make sense of the data from museums for me. Two relate to demographics and barriers to visitation. And the other three are connected to the themes of access, authority, and activism, which are interwoven into the entirety of the toolkit. So I'll chat through those three that are connected to the themes. The first two are a bit more self-explanatory. So getting to relevance through accessibility and representation. Museums strive to remove barriers to visitation by creating accessible, safe, and welcoming environments for all visitors. Identifying the barriers that remain and removing those barriers can increase participation of occasional and non-visitors. So the data story provides data to back up this narrative. Telling the truth, trustworthiness, learning, and sharing authority. At a time when confidence in public institutions is becoming increasingly tenuous, museums continue to hold the trust of Canadians. Our research affirms that the public continues to value museums as trustworthy sources of information. Even people who identify as non-visitors trust museums. And finally, social change, activism, and neutrality. The museum sector is currently grappling with the shifting role of museums as active advocates for social change. Some museums are taking steps to address social issues relevant to their communities in their exhibits, collections, and programs. But some museums are hesitant to embrace the role of advocates for social change out of concern over public expectations for museums to remain, remain neutral. So this data story explores the data to support the role of museum as an active advocate for social change. So that's an overview of the communications tools. The last type of tool is the advocacy tools. So these tools will support you in advocating for your museum, the sector, and for community issues outside of your museum. There's a case for support and explainer. A case for support is an adaptable fundraising document that includes an explainer to help you customize the case as well as an example of a finished case. So you can use this template to create a values-based fundraising document for your own museum that uses the data from Museums for Me to support the social value of your museum. 
letter templates targeting all three levels of government as well as a community support letter template are also included. So you can use these templates to create a letter writing campaign for your own museum. And an advocacy policy template and action guide. This guide includes an advocacy policy template for both internal and external advocacy, as well as a step-by-step -step action guide for doing the work of advocacy. So we are going to explore this resource in a little more detail. So this resource was created in response to the need for museums to take a more active role in advocating for societal issues. Remembering that 44% of respondents think that museums need to be taking a more active role in advocacy, but this number rises to 62% for ages 18 to 34. This resource is really important for the future of museums. So let's briefly chat about what we mean when we talk about advocacy. Advocacy relates to how a museum is actively working to advance a particular cause or issue to change opinion, policy, or practice. Within Reconsidering Museums, we define advocacy very broadly, as advocacy can take on many different forms, depending on a museum's circumstance or place in its community. Every museum will advocate differently and work on various social and environmental issues, Included, but including but not limit, limited to climate change, indigenous issues and reconciliation, local community issues, etc. So in addition to advocating for social change, a museum may also wish to advocate for internal or industry-wide relations, such as financial support, staff and board support, etc. So when we're talking about advocacy, we're kind of talking about these two types, internal, advocating for your museum, whether it's more funding, more awareness, and then advocating for issues outside of your museum, issues that are in the community that you might care about as an institution or as an individual. <clears throat> so there are a number of foundational considerations for an organization, its board and staff to consider to step into the work of advocacy. The five C's that you see on the screen are phases that are important and essential in order for museums to be successful with their advocacy work. So the five C's are considerations, consciousness, courage, conversation and collaboration, and finally clarity. So you can learn more about the five C's in the guide. I won't go into a ton of depth on that today, just in the interest of time. So what is the purpose of the advocacy policy template and action guide? The purpose is to help museums self-identify where they are at in their advocacy journey and to provide insights and examples on how they may go about conducting advocacy and developing an advocacy policy to make real and lasting change. We've heard that it's time for museums to speak up and out on issues that support their mission and their communities, to take a stance on these issues and not remain neutral especially in times of immediate support. So what is an advocacy policy? An advocacy policy is a policy approved by the museum's board of directors in a motion that outlines the causes, ideas, and issues that are important to the museum. More importantly, it delineates how the museum as a whole will react to moral or civic challenges that arise in your communities. The policy acts as a reference to ensure that roles within the museum's teams are clearly defined when it comes to advocacy efforts. Developing an advocacy policy will ensure that your museum board, staff, and volunteers are all on the same page about how you conduct advocacy efforts internally and externally. And it really enables you to act quickly and to act confidently and to know that you're aligned with your museum's policies when having to make decisions. Okay, so like I said, the toolkit will be at the full toolkit will be available to download March 15th. That's a week from today. Um, and the toolkit provides resources for museums to do the work of being responsive and adaptive, but the project is not an end to itself. While the data collected through museums for me provides valuable insights into the public perceptions of the role, value, and future of museums, museums must continue to connect with, listen to, and respond to their own communities. The resources in the Reconsider Museums Toolkit are not one size fits all. They are designed to be adaptable and customizable to your own specific museum and context. 
the work of reconsidering the role and value of museums is ongoing. Finally, I just want to note that this project has been funded by the Government of Canada through the Canada Cultural Investment Fund and the Province of Alberta through the Community Initiatives Program. We are very grateful for the funding that enabled us to do the research and create the toolkit. And that is my final slide. So thank you for listening to me. Um, I hope you're excited for the toolkit, which is coming next week. You can download it at reconsideringmuseums.ca. If you have any questions, um, you can contact me at info at reconsideringmuseums.ca. That email comes directly to me. Um, so if you have any questions about the project or are interested in learning more about the resources, I am very happy to chat um, and help you explore how the resources can help your museum. So I am going to stop sharing. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was really great. My to-do list, I keep, kept keeping notes on the side of, what do I need to do? <laughs> um, so my to-do list is growing just from talking to you. And I know I've been looking at the versions of this coming along. It's yeah. really great to see this. Um, advocacy, I've been saying, is an increasingly important role for museums. And it's something that none of us are very familiar with or comfortable with. So having these resources is gonna be a really great step forward. So I wanna turn it over to the group for chat uh, for any conversations or questions. I think the easiest thing for people to do is to put a question in the chat and then we will share it that way. We'll give people a minute to that. The other thing I'll mention is when the toolkit is released, we will um, be linking to it on the Ansem website. And I believe PEI New Brunswick will be doing the same thing. So if anyone can't remember that URL, they can find that. Well, we're getting people to think about everything. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about test, testing the kits. I know you did it with the pilot museums and I think that process of working with the pilot museums is really an important piece. I know for me, especially with this Nova Scotia lens, we're like, oh, but this comes from Edmonton. It's this big city project. And where I really got buy-in on the project is when you guys started doing the piloting and working with all the different museums and the different sizes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? I think that really was my buy-in point. Sure, yeah, it was really important. I mean, it's difficult to do a national project for a sector that is so diverse, like the museum sector. Um, and so I think it was really important um, for us to be able to create resources that were useful to different sizes of museums. So like specific enough that they provide, you know, valuable data insights and things that were useful, but also sort of generic enough that museums could adapt them to their own, to their own site. So we were trying to sort of strike that balance, which I think is a difficult balance to strike. So when we, when we decided to pilot, um, in Alberta, we were really looking for a variety of sites that had really diverse needs and really diverse audiences. So everything from the Royal Alberta Museum, which is our provincial museum in Alberta, um, you know, a very large staff, a provincial mandate, well-funded, um, all the way down to somewhere like Millet Museum and Archives, which is, Millet is a small town of I don't know off the top of my head. But I, I googled say. it. It's 1,800 people. Okay, I was going to guess 2,000, so it's pretty close. But like <laughs> That's why I want you to mention. I'm like, we're talking little places as pilot. Yeah. yeah, Millet is a small town um, that has, you know, the challenges that come along with kind of a small town rural museum. They are funded by their local municipal government, and they um, they were really excited to participate in this project because they, they know the challenges that face rural museums, um, whether it's funding challenges, challenges connecting with newcomers and diverse audiences, and they just really saw the value in the project and wanted to make sure that the tools that we created were actually useful for them. So the way that we piloted the toolkit was we piloted the messaging with all six sites. And then we, we kind of worked closely with some of the individual sites on specific tools and resources. So we worked with Millet, for example, on developing the letter templates for municipal governments because they work with a small rural municipal government and they had insights into what would work well with that government and what would, um, what would sort of fly with them. And then when we're working with the Royal Alberta Museum, we're working on different levels of tools. I mean, the Royal Alberta Museum isn't going to adapt our fundraising document, the case for support, because that's not a need for them. They are funded by the provincial government. They don't, 
they don't need to access those sorts of resources. So we acknowledge too that certain resources will be more helpful for different types of sites, um, but we wanted to ensure that um, it was really usable by all different types of sites. And I mean, I know rural and remote um, museums make up a huge portion of the number of museums across the country and in Alberta as well. I mean, I think at least half of our museums are in, in rural areas. And so we wanted to make sure we were supporting that, so. There was an Indigenous led uh, museum in that group too. I want to make there sure was. you were aware of yeah. Yeah, thanks for um, pointing that out. So Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park um, was one of our pilot museums, and they're actually the first Indigenous-led museum to be an accredited museum with the Alberta Museums Association, um, and they became accredited a year or two ago and then joined the project and have really been giving valuable insights on a lot of the messaging as well. So we've had a diverse group of folks really supporting this project. Like I said, to me, that was the buy-in, and that's why I wanted to make sure that was talked. It was really great. So I'm just going to the chat here. Yeah. Um, there's a comment here, thanks for all the hard work. I cannot believe a national study has not been done since 1973. That is hard to believe. Um, I'm sure the data itself will be used by many researchers. Do you have any plans to follow up research or data collection? Were there, for, were there further research questions that became very apparent for other researchers to engage? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I also couldn't believe that there hadn't been a national study done in 50 years. That, that, um, that's wild to me that that has been that long. Um, so there was a real need for this. There was a real need for a national project to do, to do some data collection and some research. Um, for now, we have archived the site. Um, we, do, we do recognize that there's a need to not wait another 50 years to follow up on this data. Um, and so we are hoping that the Consortium of Provincial and Territorial Museums Associations and the Canadian Museums Association will find a way to follow up on this data, whether it's in five years time, 10 years time, and whether that means reissuing the survey um, in the same form or adapting it to sort of fit, fit the new times in five years, it, adapting it how we see fit. I think it's really important that we get some follow up. Um, that we get some follow-up research on this because if we wait another 50 years, there's so much that can change in 50 years. And I just think that's unacceptable for the sector to be working without really good data. Um, and one of the interesting things that came out of the data was some of the pieces that we received were kind of already common knowledge in the, in the sector. So we know that, you know, I think most people who work in museums know that people feel welcome and safe in museums, but it's so important when you're applying for funding and when you're trying to, you know, advocate for new projects that you actually have the data. Because it's one thing between saying this through anecdotal experience, and there's another thing by saying, okay, we've done the research, we have this data, and this is really important for our sector to professionalize the sector um, and just to help us in our advocacy with government in particular, who's really interested in those hard numbers. Yeah. Um, questions that came out of the data, there's for sure follow-up questions. I mean, I think anytime you do research like this, once you get the data, you say, oh, well, why didn't we ask this? We should have you know, we should have followed up on this. And I think for me, I think, and the team, what's been most interesting is the shift around the term neutrality and the role of museums um, and the sort of push for them to be that credible advocate and moving away from the idea of neutrality. So I think we would have maybe dived a little bit deeper into different ways that museums can do that um, and different ways that the public wants to see that. So maybe a follow-up survey would delve deeper into that sort of activism theme. I'm sure there can be a lot of academics and research that are gonna take this and go in their own direction. So next question is coming from Joanne at Dartmouth Heritage Museum. And for anyone who doesn't know, they've been very involved in advocacy recently due to municipal mm -hmm. funding challenges. Um, do you have any stories to share about any success stories, museums that are making inspirational headway in advocacy? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually, we did think about doing case studies as part of this project, but in the end, it just, um, it didn't sort of fit into our timeline and the scope of the project. But I think that that would have been really valuable. Um, I'm pulling up the advocacy policy on my, um, on my other screen, which is why I'm looking away right now, because I just want to make sure I'm getting the names of these organizations right. Um, but we, when we did the advocacy policy and action guide, we were looking for so we piloted the toolkit as a whole with those six Alberta museums. But when we did the advocacy policy and action guide, we were looking for readers and reviewers who were actively engaged in advocacy at their museum to review the policy 
to ensure that it was useful for museums that were already sort of doing the work. So we were asking them, you're already doing this work, what are you, what are you missing? And so we do have some examples of some great museums that are doing really good advocacy work and they are the readers and reviewers of the policy and action guide. Um, so a few of them, I can't go into depth around what, what they're doing, but we worked with the Tumblr Ridge Museum in BC, which is really kind of forward thinking with activists activism. We worked with the Cree Cultural Institute in Northern Quebec, who again has made some really um, good strides in terms of like community relations and how they're thinking about collecting um, and ownership of collections. They've done some really good advocacy work. We worked with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, which again has really been working in this area. Um, we worked with um, it's escaping me, but we worked with a museum in Nova Scotia. Maggie, who did we work with in Nova oh, Scotia? Oh, uh, Shelburne. Was it Shelburne? No, it was. Um, there were a few from Nova Scotia that were suggested. I think yeah. Nova Scotia is doing quite a bit of good work. Um, That's what I was going to say. I can't remember who yeah. you ended up for. I sent a couple emails, um, but I think Nova Scotia is doing some really good work. And yeah. you and Joanne, you might be an example of success. And going forward, I think as we build on this, there will be more opportunities to share it. Yeah. But I think there, it would be, it, I mean, and maybe that's a follow up for this project as well, is to do some case studies of museums that have already made that shift and are advocating for issues outside of their community and have a, found a really good balance and a way to do that and have supportive boards and supportive staffs that are sort of supporting this work, because it's happening. Um, I think a lot of museums are at different phases and different stages, yeah. and we can learn from our, our peers that are, you know, a step ahead. I should have worn my museums are not a neutral shirt for this meeting, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, so next question or comment was from Hilda at the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic, and they've been doing advocacy kind of in a different way. They've been doing early ones to do um, some talk about treaty education, fisheries um, stories, mm -hmm. and she was just saying she's really excited to get the toolkit. Um, they've been at the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic. They've been seeing an advocate for ocean preservation and safety at sea. So I think yeah. that's a different type of advocacy that you'll be able to engage with. Mm -hmm. Dartmouth Heritage Museum, just to fill you in, has been doing more funding advocacy. And like Joanne said, it's been really scary what they've had to deal with, but it's really motivational to see this come together. Yeah. And, and well, we're bringing an advocacy working group together soon. So we're looking forward to seeing some of this happen. I think one of the exciting things that came out of the data was that stat that younger generations are even more are wanting to see museums take a stand and actively advocate for change that there's a shift happening and so while it might seem scary to sort of jump into that advocacy your audience is going to force you to do it you know whether you do it now or whether you do it later that's what's coming um, and I actually think that's really exciting because that actually can enable museums to say to confidently say we are we are going to take this step yeah i think um interesting hilda adds interesting to note that our advocacy has led to funding from occupational health and safety hmm. uh, for those who may be interested in engaging these protocols may be helpful and there's a link here for everyone to check out i clicked through to that link okay. i'll i'll have a look at that site We've also on the website, there's a page of additional resources because we know that reconsidering museums can't provide everything and we didn't try to provide everything. I, I mentioned in my presentation, the move to action report, um, which was sort of being developed alongside this project. The CMA was working on it on the same time we were working on this. So we had a lot of conversations um, about not wanting to duplicate work, but also making sure that we are supporting each other's work. Um, and we have a page that links to work that's been done by our partners and other organizations sort of in the sector that can help support. They're almost like additional tools in the toolkit that weren't developed by us, but that are sort of part of the work that we're trying to do. We've talked about advocacy some. I just want to have you talk a little bit, a little bit more about that common language. Um, in our recent conversations with politicians in Nova Scotia, that need for common language is coming out is increasingly important. And I think museums are all raising issues. And sometimes we're saying the same thing but using different words. And you talked about the importance of this toolkit to give us all a common way to talk about things. Yeah. I wonder if you want to mention, talk about that again anyway. 
Yeah, I mean, it just became so obvious when we were looking at the way that even the public, so the sector itself, I think, is still struggling to find a common language, but there's even a bigger disconnect between the way the public speaks about museums and the way that museum workers speak about their work. Um, and even something as simple as elitist, I think that perception that museums are elitist actually persists within the sector, that somehow the sector still thinks that they are perceived as, that we are perceived as elitist. And so just trying to move away from talking about museums that way, um, I think is really helpful because one of the interesting things about language as well is even if, if you keep saying museums are not elitist, museums are not elitist, you're still associating museums with elitist, with elitism. And so actually moving away from that language altogether can be the most helpful way to sort of step forward and step away from that conversation. Um, and the word that actually prompted us to create the language recommendations was that word neutral, because it came up time and time again in the survey. And we found that the public was actually contradicting themselves. They were using neutrality in a way that the, you know, that that museum workers were not using it. And they were like, they would say, yes, museums should actively advocate for social change. And oh, but they should also stay neutral and apolitical. And yes, that may work, but I think in the public's mind, there's a little bit of a contradiction there. So we thought, why don't we just move away from that word neutral because there's no agreement around what that actually means um, and why can we move to some more productive language? Yes, when you get people off that hung up on a single word, it really helps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christine yeah. Sikora from the Nova Scotia Museum says, thank you for a great presentation and the amazing work. I'm also looking forward to getting the kit. I thought the observation on age group was very interesting. I may have missed it, but was, there, was the data cross-referenced with culture, satellite, account, et cetera? I'm not, I'm not sure what that is. But Christine, um, I can follow up with you about that if we- I, oh. Is that the economic framework that you're referring to? I think it's maybe an economic um, framework that the government of Canada uses to sort of assess economic value of the sector. Um, I will say we did, we, we, so a few years ago, the GLAM study was released by the CMA, which is more related to the economic value and the economic impact of the sector. So we didn't cross-reference, um, we didn't cross-reference the Museums for Me data with that cultural satellite account, because um, we were more focused on the social um, impact and the social value of museums, but I do wonder if the GLAM study did, which again is one of the resources that we reference on the site because it's sort of part of this larger toolkit of resources that have been created by the museums associations across the country. If that's what you're referring to, I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar. And if that's not it, we'll reconnect on that information. Yeah. Well, on that note, I uh, see we're coming to the end of our time, and this was just really good. Like I keep saying, for the advocacy work we're looking at doing in Nova Scotia, the museums we're talking with, um, the even just using this common language, I think there's going to be so much good coming out of this. And I think everybody's going to see this showing up in the work that we're doing at Ansem um, and coming out of national projects. So thank you so much. I'm really excited to for the launch next week. Um, in Ansem tradition, we wish you lots of cake. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, Ansem has an official cake policy, and we are very excited to share Wish You Cake when this launches next week. So on that thank note, <laughs> I was going to say thank you for joining us, and I'll give you the last word if you want anything. Say. Oh, I'll just say thank you for listening. We're really excited to be releasing this toolkit. It's been a culmination of um, a lot of people, people's efforts across the country. And we're really grateful for the contributions of our partners in the Atlantic provinces as well. So thanks to all of you who contributed um, through your museums association and uh, hope you can all find something useful in the toolkit. Thank you. And for anybody who is still here, a reminder that Museums Canada work or summit is at the end of the month and we still have some bursaries available. And Ansem is doing the reorg workshop at the end of the month, and spaces are running out. But if you would like to join the reorg workshop on collections reorganization, there is information on our Ansem website. So please join us. <laughs>